Hi, hi, my name is Caio Milani. I'm director of product management. I'm responsible for the infrastructure features of the product, which includes security, but also include replication, high availability, backup, manageability. And today we'll be talking about security. Uh, my past, I worked at Symantec together uh, with other uh, fellows here at uh, MarkLogic, and Rangan will be talking initially about the current features, and at the end I'll talk about what is coming in nine. Rangan. Thank you, thank you, Carl. So, um, my name is Rangan Deriswami, and I used to work at uh, quite large uh, companies like Oracle, uh, Symantec, Verisign, and uh, quite a few other companies over the last 25 plus years. Uh, security is a passion of mine and has been for a very long time. This is an area where uh, I have made a lot of uh, contributions to the various projects that I've been involved in. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm looking forward to here is to uh, enlighten all of you on some of the core principles of security, how it applies to MarkLogic, and what it means to an enterprise as it is deploying applications throughout its entire ecosystem. So having said that, uh, let me quickly uh, go through the agenda items for today. What we are going to be talking about is uh, a typical enterprise deployment architecture, which tells you what a typical ecosystem in the enterprise looks like, uh, how MarkLogic will enhance the security in such an ecosystem, and then I'll touch on a little bit about how to deploy MarkLogic in a secure manner so that you can actually uh, realize the compliance and uh, security standards that you will need to have uh, in your enterprise. And then like Kyle mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what are the additional features that we are adding uh, in the upcoming releases, which will not only also augment uh, the security features in MarkLogic. And then we'll have enough time for Q&A. So please feel free to touch on any topic, not necessarily uh, on MarkLogic. Uh, pretty much anything related to security is uh, fair game. Okay, so uh, having said that, uh, what does this picture tell us? Uh, you see a chain uh, linked together with a piece of thread and uh, looking at it, you can possibly say that uh, this is not a very strong uh, solution to securing whatever it's supposed to secure, right? So things are not always as obvious as this picture. Uh, if you happen to not notice the string, then you know it is insecure. It's not as strong. But if it is hidden, it's obscured, then you think you're secure, but you really aren't. So security is only as strong as the weakest link in your enterprise. So the aim should be for each and every person who works in an enterprise who is responsible for deploying applications, the entire security of the ecosystem, to figure out where all the weak links are, how to identify them, and how to plug those links. So that's, that's how you should approach security. At a very high level, let's take a look at what a typical enterprise architecture looks like. Right? Here we have the standard uh, three-tier architecture, which is still very widely used in a lot of large enterprises hasn't changed a lot. Uh, it is just that uh, the deployment oscillates between on-premise and uh, to the cloud and on-premise. If you all remember, the network computer was the cloud at some point in time, which was way back when Sun came up with their concept. Right? And then you had everything moving to the data center. And then the cost aspect of deploying applications, managing, maintaining them, moved everything out to off-premise. But then there are certain elements of the data center that it needs to be on-premise for a variety of compliance and data security needs. So you have a hybrid model. So take, let's take a look at uh, what security means in such an enterprise, right? So you have the clients, clients and third-party services. You should assume they are untrusted until proven otherwise. So you start out with the basic notation that 
nothing is trusted in entering your ecosystem. So the, what can you do to validate and establish trust? I'll talk a little bit about that. So once you come into your uh, enterprise network, you have your DMZ or the zone where all your applications run. You may or may not have a firewall between your application layer and the repository layer, but it's advisable to have one. Security is all about raising the bar. Right? You want to be able to make sure that you put as many obstacles as possible to a potential attacker so that he has very little incentive to get to your data. Now that is primarily driven by the value of the data. If it is high value data, then you, no matter how many obstacles you put, there will be persistent attempts to breach the system. Now if you are worried about classification of data, that's an ongoing thing that enterprises are still struggling with today. So how do you classify data as low value, medium value, and high value? Today, they do it by organizational structure. Anything related to finance, they say, is secure. Anything related to HR needs to be protected. And anything else is needs to be at a level of security which is at a medium or semi-medium level. There should be nothing in your enterprise that should be of low data classification at all. Let's take a look at how you can classify these things. Now, security is all about the main three things that everybody talks about is the C, I, and A. What is C? C is confidentiality. You want to make sure that only the right people have access to the right kind of data. And that is something that is enforced and is able to be verified. Integrity. You want to make sure that data hasn't been compromised and changed and is not modified in any manner. There are various ways to achieve that. And then the last thing in this is authenticity. You want to be able to authenticate users and authenticate entities, what I call entities in the enterprise. Now, entities could be users, it could be machines, it could be devices, it could be applications, it could be anything that is playing in your ecosystem. Normally, uh, authentication is associated with users, but we will see later on why it's important to have authentication for entities other than users as well. Now let's talk a little bit about the three pillars of application security. The three pillars of application security are primarily authentication, talked about validating the identity. Here we have a concept called a security principle. In security, one of the things that you will need to uh, keep in mind is terminology is extremely important and is critical. When we say a principle, it can be anything. An unauthenticated principle is equivalent to an anonymous user, whereas the moment a principle is authenticated, it becomes a security principle. And the security principle then can be assigned certain roles and responsibilities that you could have that security principle assume in your enterprise ecosystem. right? So authentication is identifying who it is, authorization, what is it that you can do, and how do you know whether the authenticated security principle really was able to access the resources that he was allowed to access. That's where auditing comes in. You need to be able to audit pretty much everything in an enterprise. Now the levels of auditing may depend on the level of certifications that you might need in an enterprise. It's possible that you may have to comply to certain regulations if you are a regulated uh, industry. Then in those cases, those uh, standards will translate into 
deployment uh, checklists for you so that you can deploy it in a manner that is consistent. Now let's, let me tell you a little bit about uh, security in MarkLogic. One of the things that you might have heard over the uh, last couple of days is security is core to MarkLogic. It is something that has been there in the product since day one. Normally what people do is they build an application and then say, oh, it all works, great, fine, let's figure out how to secure this. Then it becomes what is known as a bolted on security model. In such a scenario, you will be addressing only certain parts of the weak links that you come to know as you exercise and deploy the product. So one of the things that as you develop applications for your enterprise, you need to be able to do is to do a secure design. Make sure that you introduce security at the design phase. Do your threat modeling. Do your vulnerability analysis. And then you would have identified a majority of the weak links in the enterprise. Now, you may not get to all because there will be some deployment and runtime scenarios that you will need to address as well. That is something that I'll cover later on, how to address those. Mark logic, as like I mentioned, has uh, quite a bit of uh, standards, the certification. Common criteria is one of the well-recognized and well-known uh, certifications. It is highly recognized. And it's something that we are very proud of because this is, we are one of the only NoSQL database vendors that has this certification. As you might uh, know and heard over the last couple of days, we have been deployed in quite a few of the secure systems in uh, the federal agencies. So we do have uh, ICD 503 and DITCAP certification as well. Now, a little bit about authentication in MarkLogic. Right? I told you about authentication is all about validating entities. When you want to authenticate an entity, in MarkLogic it could be a user, it could be any object that you want to authenticate as an entity. Now, you can have MarkLogic authenticate a user who is local in a standalone deployment. If you are authenticating a user as part of an enterprise-wide system, you will have a deployment of usually a namespace of a directory. And the directory could be a adapt directory, which is mostly what enterprises use. In Microsoft-only deployments, Kerberos is an authentication mechanism that is used very widely. But in hybrid environments, you could have both being deployed in an enterprise. Some subsystems in the enterprise could be authenticating against the LDAP directory. And most of the user uh, uh, principles will be authenticating against Active Directory. Now, in addition to authentication, you can also leverage the roles that you have specified in your MarkLogic uh, instance. Now, you can have what are known as user-defined roles for the enterprise in LDAP, and you can also define roles in MarkLogic which are pertinent to entities that are defined and managed in MarkLogic. Now, why is authorization important? The reason why you have authorization is to make sure that the right person has the right access to the right resource. Right? Now, users will have access to certain sets of resources, and then the system admins will have access to certain resources, and then the DBAs will have access to certain resources. Now, in setting up a security model, what you want to do is make sure you have separation of duties. You want to make sure that the sysadmin does not have access to their databases. The database admin should not have access to the operating system at any point in time. That's the most secure model. It's possible that these two things overlap. 
in such scenarios, please make sure that you have auditing turned on and widely used so that you know who did what in your enterprise ecosystem. So let's take a quick look at the various models that we support in uh, MarkLogic. We do support uh, uh, RBAC. RBAC is a well-known standard. Role-based access control where the roles are defined for users and the user can be associated with one or more roles. Now privileges in MarkLogic are permissions that are given to be able to create URIs and to be able to modify URIs. Now in order to be able to read, write, update documents in MarkLogic, you can assign those permissions as well. Now a combination of roles, privileges and permissions will give you the security model you need to be able to pretty much handle all of your authorization needs in MarkLogic. So in addition to document level uh, access controls, we have support for ABAC. ABAC is attribute level access control, wherein you can specify controls on certain elements or attributes in a document. Why this is important? You might want to uh, not give access to social security numbers, for example certain critical information in documents. In that case, you would put uh, access control on those set of attributes. And policy based, you could have policies defined in documents and only the people who have update or insert or uh, managing doc uh, policy documents, they will have the ability to change those. Now let's talk a little bit about auditing. Why is auditing important? It's not only enough to say that, yes, I have a security model and now I know who is going to come in and authenticate themselves, who is allowed access to what, but was that actually implemented? Was that enforced? Why is it important? Because there are certain regulatory requirements that require people to report who accessed what, when, and why. So in that case, if you don't have auditing turned on or auditing being used, then it becomes very difficult to be able to track who did what and why. So one of the things that will enable you to do this is we have secure versioning support in MarkLogic. Auditing, like I mentioned, is, uh, is a capability that you should be using by default. And one of the things that you should always focus on is deploying patches for all of your secure products. Never ever forget to do that. Like I said, uh, you're only as secure as the weakest link. If you, if you don't keep your enterprise ecosystem up to date with all of the security patches, you are vulnerable in various parts of the enterprise. So here's a typical uh, three-tier model. We have the end user clients, the application servers, and the database cluster. So let's take a quick look at how to secure these three things. Like I mentioned, end user clients assume that all devices are insecure to begin with. Don't trust any of them. So when you bring in your own phone, for example, in an enterprise, it's not trusted. You need to authenticate it. And part of that authentication process means you will need to provision some sort of credential to the endpoint that will allow you to authenticate that device to your enterprise network. So that's typically what's called the BYOD deployment scenarios, where you bring your own device and then uh, enter it into the ecosystem of the enterprise. Now, if the enterprise does still deploy images of operating systems to endpoints and also manages the assets that are being used in the enterprise. Make sure that you have a consistent model in which you provision the binary images. Make sure they are all secure 
and you have validated each one of them before you push them out to your endpoints. One of the things that people tend to do is, in large enterprises I haven't seen that much of an issue, but in medium and what are known as mid-size deployments, people start issuing their own certificates, right? So if you really want to be secure to a point where you can say that I'll be able to meet all of the strict stringent criteria that I'll need to for certification, don't use self-signed certs. Get a cert from one of the well-known certificate authorities. There is a lot of process that goes through uh, in issuing a sub-CA cert. It's a little bit expensive, but is well worth the support for the security model that you'll need in the enterprise. Another thing that you should also consider is use multi-factor authentication. We use it every single day, we just don't realize it. When you go to withdraw your money from your ATM, you are doing authentication. How? You have a card, which is yours, and then you have a pin. So something you have and something you know. We do it every day, but still a lot of enterprises just use username passwords. They are getting uh, a little bit better in terms of using multiple factors of authentication, depending on policy. So those are what are known as policy-based authentications, wherein if you want access to certain resources, you'll have to provide higher levels of credentials. Simple username and password will get you into the system, but if you want access to certain documents, then you will need to provide a stronger piece of credential, maybe a card, maybe a PKI certificate something that you know can validate the user. And in extremely secure environments, depending on the data that you're trying to protect, biometrics is also widely used as well in enterprises. So let's take a look at uh, what is it that you need to do to harden the environment. Now, if you take a look at uh, the app deployment scenario, like I mentioned, Make sure all of your uh, operating systems are up to date with security patches. And remove all of the unwanted services from your machines. It's very easy to forget that. It comes turned on by default. Have a checklist and say that these are things I need to turn off. Disable all the ports that you don't need to use. Because these are all weak links in your security ecosystem and use what are known as machine-to-machine -machine authentication. Validate your entities. You can do that even with VM images today. One of the things that we have seen, which seems to be a major security issue in most of the enterprises is they do not configure their load balancers properly. Load balancers work in a variety of deployment scenarios. And you will need to configure not only the authentication mechanisms, but also the policies that are being enforced by the load balancer. So make sure you do that correctly in the enterprise. A misconfigured system is your weakest link in your chain. One of the other things that you might want to do also is uh, use enhanced IDM services. What are enhanced IDM services? Normally LDAP talks on port 389. Shut down port 389. Force end clients to authenticate using port 443, which is the port that is a secure port. To start a TLS negotiation, and then it will secure the channel for you. Now, we talked a little bit about the value of data. The database cluster or the database environment is where pretty much all of your data resides. Right? Now, it's extremely important to do everything that we talked about up to this point in time and do a little bit more because you might have heard of all the recent data breaches that we had. How did that come about? They found a weak link, according to the enterprise, 
and got into your data tier. You have ransomware today, where people are demanding money to be able to restore data back to your system. So start encrypting your data. Today in MathLogic, you can do that with eight. You might have heard Joe mention this as a feature in nine. It is, you can do it today. The way you would do it is you would use transparent data encryption. You can use uh, what are known as TD agents. We have certified with Warmetric and a whole bunch of other uh, enterprise capable systems that will allow you to encrypt data as it's being written to storage and is being extracted from storage. It is being natively implemented in MathLogic 9. I think Kyle will go over some of the feature details in the later half of the presentation. So just to recap, secure your end user authentication, devices, users, have a secure password policy, make sure you have a good password rotation and password management in place and enforce it. Having a policy is one thing, but not implementing it is a whole different thing. That's where auditing comes in. You want to be able to make sure that whatever policies you have put in place are actually being used and are being enforced. Secure the channels. Use well-known CAs. Always use SSL. Block all the un unopened ports that you will have. Never allow just HTTP access. There may be reasons to allow that, but then you should be aware of the potential risks that you're opening up over these unsecured channels. Again, make sure that all communication within your enterprise ecosystem is secure and encrypt the data tier if you really, really are worried about valuable data being compromised. One of the key things about data encryption is not so much the encryption technology, it's all about key management. Once you encrypt data, you should be able to not only have a good policy for key rotation, key management, key archival, and key retrieval, because if you encrypt the data and you lose your key, there's not much you can do. So it's extremely important to think through your key management policies. and. Kyle will cover that a little bit in his presentation. Yes? The second firewall you're showing, yes. is that only possible if your E nodes are separate from your D nodes versus having dual purpose nodes? Uh, that's one of the deployment scenarios where you would have a D node. Yeah. Oh, the, the question is if you have, a, a, is it possible to have a firewall only when you have D nodes and E nodes uh, separate? That's one possible deployment scenario, where if your D nodes are in your data tier, and then your E nodes, which are evaluator nodes, are in your app layer. So you could. Yeah, you may also think about uh, scenarios that you have a, a three-tier deployment that have a Node.js. That will be a separate, completely separate from the database, and then you can have a firewall. That's another scenario as well, that you, you will be able to have a firewall. Uh, for WebDAB, uh, you can secure the ch pipe, but not the actual protocol. You can secure the pipe. The transport pipe you can definitely secure. Okay. So this is a high-level overview of what we talked about. The Here it is sort of condensed into two tiers, wherein you have the end user as the one tier, and then mark logic, app servers, and clusters as part of a middle tier. Now, you could deploy them in all two, three tiers or collapse them into two. The, the principles that I talked about in terms of securing your enterprise ecosystem apply regardless of where it is. Okay. So, okay, on so to Kyle. Uh, we learned a little bit about the, the aspects of the CIA model. 
I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to enhance how you handle confidentiality in the product and a little bit of the integrity as well. Okay, the first feature you already heard this morning from Joe Pasqua is encryption. What we're doing in terms of encryption is encrypting data, config, and logs. And the idea here is to prevent, for instance, a CZ mean from having access to the data. Once it's encrypted the database, even if the CZ mean can see the files, he will not be able to see the content. We also want to enhance by providing a separation of control about who generates the keys and who is using the keys. That actually prevents a DBA from moving data around without talking to the secured admin. So this will help you met, uh, met uh, stringent uh, guidelines such as FIPS or healthcare or PHI. Let me talk in more details about how it works. So uh, why you should care about this? Why are the database layer? That's a common question. I want to go through some examples. There are mandates in financials that actually tell you that you have to encrypt at the database. The same for government. FIPS is very specific. You have to encrypt at the database. Healthcare, there is a new mandate that tells you have to encrypt names, doctor notes, and so on. I want to give two real examples of if you not encrypt, what can happen. The first in publishing. Three companies, New Newswire, PR, uh, Newswire, MarketWire, and BusinessWire. These three companies, they receive information from a company about uh, financial performance. They receive a few hours before it's published to the market. What uh, hackers did, they actually were able to get access from the, to the database. They dumped the database hours before it was available to the, to the market, and they simply traded on the information. It took a while for them to figure out the guys made $100 million in, in illegal profits, just trading. Simple scenario, documents, access to the database. The other use case here, online business. Ashley Madsen had a, a business. What hackers did, they simply dumped the database file. If you're going online, you can actually find the database is still available. It's a dump of the MySQL database. No encryption, you can load that anywhere. The company is almost out of business after this. It was a, a massive problem for them. So that's why you should think about encrypting at the database because even if you get access to the files, it's really hard to figure out what is there. In nine, as I said, encryption at the database and it's actually you decide which database. You may have multiple databases in the cluster. You'll figure out which database I want to encrypt that allows you to go one by one or just encrypt uh, highly sensitive data and data uh, that's not required, you don't need to. You can also encrypt the logs. Why it's important to encrypt logs? Because logs may have confidential information as well. Especially app logs may dump some information about queries and so on. So it's important to encrypt that as well. Config files. If uh, someone that hacks into the system is able to understand the config, they can use that information to do further damage. So we also will allow you to encrypt config files. And finally, backup. You want to keep that information stored in a S3 deployment or even on tape. We will allow you to encrypt that as well. We have two types of key management. Local, which is provided by MarkLogic. So if you have a laptop, you could use MarkLogic with encryption and MarkLogic will handle all key management. But the most secure way of deploying is using an external key management system. In a data center, you would rely on an external key management to generate keys that it will use to envelope. And I'll talk in details how you should think about this. This separation of control will make it very hard for a DBA to move data around. So when you do that, you prevent the sysadmin and the DBA from moving data around. And the main question, everyone, oh, what about performance? At this point, we already know that this is low single digit impact. So you should expect some performance hit, but it's very small. And the idea here is you should turn this thing on. You should turn it on, right? You should take the hit and be more secure. But it's a small hit.
Roxy. Roxy. So to use those uh, deployment steps, um, what, what is, what's the security on this? Modules also get encrypted? You can encrypt modules, the security database, triggers, any particular database. You, you are able to decide which databases you want to encrypt. Or is that a minimum you want to encrypt the security database? <laughs> okay, let me explain a little bit about the hierarchy because this is uh, something that differentiates Mark Logic. I'll start from the bottom here, uh, which is keys generated by Mark Logic. Here I have an object. What is an object, for instance, is a, is a stand or a journal entry. We are actually encrypting the journal entries. So every new object, we will generate a new key. What we keep doing in Mark Logic is generating new stands. So every new stand will have a new key, a new key. That key is encrypted by an envelope key, which is coming from an external entity. Mark Logic will never handle that key, will never know that key. That's inside the key management system. So the database saved to disk is saved with multiple keys, maybe thousands of keys. That makes it very, very hard for someone to figure out how data is encrypted because each chunk of data is encrypted with a different key. So even if you have access to saving data, ingesting data, it's very hard for you to find a pattern because it keeps changing. So that is very, very secure. But you may be thinking, oh, it's very hard to manage. No, Mark Lodge is handling all key management. You just have to manage one key and that key is external. It's not inside. MarkLogic will never see, the server will never see that key. As long as the key management system is secure, it's a very, very secure deployment. We have a separate key for config and a separate key for logs. So that allows you, for instance, to provide access to logs to a, an operator, but not to data. So that person will never be able to move data around. The same applies to config. So separate keys will allow you to have separate processes in the company to handle how you access logs and so on. And it will also have a command line interface to help you see the logs in case Mark Logic is the process is down, you'll be able to unencrypt the logs. But if it's running, just go to the UI, click and you can see the logs. If it's not running, use the CLI. So it's a very uh, robust way of encrypting database, but it's simple. As long as you have a key management system, a single key here, very secure and simple. Only nine, and uh, it's actually available in early access too. I think I had it in the previous slide. It's available now in early access too, but it's only nine. It's not coming to eight. Okay, this is core to how we save files to disk, config, and so on. So you can already try. Uh, the version available has only local keys. The next early access will have a key management system. So you can already start playing encrypting data, config files locally in your notebook for test purposes. Okay, so this is in, in enhancing the confidentiality and also the integrity. If you, somebody goes and modifies some information on desk, it will not un encrypt and it will fail, the database will probably stop. So you also add some protection about integrity of the data, confidentiality and integrity. The other feature that Joe mentioned uh, this morning, he mentioned two features I'll cover both here, is the redaction and the element level security. Focus on confidentiality. Have some information that should not be distributed to everyone in the company. So the idea, for instance, I want to prevent some users from seeing a social security number, or I want to have a database dump for QA that should not have real social security numbers, or even I have a partner that should receive some information, I want to modify it or remove that information. Let me walk you through these two features. With an example for element level security, I have very simple structure here, a person, a location, and the informant about who, who told me that John lives in Florida in, in that particular GPS location. If I have row green and I try to access that document or I try to search for information, if I have, even if I try to search for Mike, but my row is green and I set the proper rules, I will never hit that document. Mike does not exist for me. The only thing that I can see is John. 
If I search for John, I will find that document. If I try to do an FN doc, this is gone. Okay, that's the, the idea. If I have a different row, I can see, for, for instance, the location. And of course, somebody with the top secret row here will be able to see the entire document, will be able to do search, will be able to search for Mike. So there's only one person that can actually search and find documents that have Mike with top secret. So that's how it, uh, in, in principle, it works. Let me tell you how you actually implement. We have a new concept called a protected path. MarkLogic is a document database schema-less. There is no schema. So we don't know how information that is coming to the, ba data, <coughs> excuse me, the database is formed. But there may, the document by itself has information about that is self-describing. For instance, the document will have an element that may be called SSN or may have an attribute called classification. So we are using, uh, continue to allow you to have a flexible model in just as this, and you use an expat expression to find the information that you want to conceal. My example here, I'm finding employees that have classification unclassified, they use for unclassified, and I'm, I'm telling that if I have unclassified role, I'll be able to see that. I created another protected path saying that if it says top secret, only top secret role. If I don't have any of those roles, I will not be able to see even the uh, classified as unclassified. If I have top secret, if I have a hierarchy of roles, meaning that top secret has secret, who has unclassified, I'll be able to see the entire document. So that allows you to keep the flexible model and we'll find the information. This can be combined with compartment security, meaning that you may require multiple roles to actually see that piece of information. And it works in queries, updates, search, everything. This is available in early access. We have most of the queries and search. We still don't have updates, but you can start playing with this. It works across XML and JSON. Actually, the same rule, you can write a rule in JSON and it will hit documents in XML and JSON. Very flexible how you use and how you define how to classify information. Maybe you specify the semantics. Sorry? Let's say I'm, I'm using an uh, Ingrid REST API call. Yeah. How do, how do I specify this, uh, that this field is element level? Yeah, so you call this, uh, here I have uh, xQuery. Uh, there's the same function for JavaScript, and it's also exposed in the REST API. I mean, you, would, you have to specify. You could specify uh, calling uh, the REST API. You don't have to go to Query Console to set this up, right? Oh, I see. But you could. You, if you want, you can do Query Console, but you can automate that through API calls. But yes, if you want to do it once. Is on the UI to uh, say that okay, this field is like this not that way? No, no. It's the, the, the APIs, multiple API and, and entry points to do that. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is uh, again, uh, you don't know the element. You don't know the element. You don't know what is coming. So you have to define a generic rule that will match uh, self-describing information about the documents. Once it's created, can we can we update it again? Yes. You can change. Uh, the only important aspect: once you change this, existing documents will be re-indexed. Because what we are doing, we are really uh, partitioning the index. So there are separate indexes in memory. So this is a really secure uh, way of guaranteeing that no queries hit that. So let's say I change the unclassified to another row. Every document that has unclassified information will be re-indexed. But we only re-index those documents. Again, very powerful and keeps the flexibility, right? We don't have a schema, so it, it adapts to that. Redaction. Uh, the idea here, here very simplified structure of a JSON document. Have John, some doctor notes. John is very sick. 
I want to export some data with MLCP. And in my scenario, I'm doing three things. I'm generating a random string for name, a random uh, phone number, and I'm just masking the first digits of the social security number. Okay? And the doctor notes, developers don't need that. Get rid entirely of that. So I'm doing four things here that are different. Our solution, very similar in nature. How do you handle the flexibility of a schema-less database? The same way here. You will specify an expat that will find information in the database that matches, for instance, social security number. And I will tell what to do with social security number. There are multiple things that you can do. For instance, you can conceal. I want to get rid of social security numbers once I export. Or I can create a cryptic masking. Can be a random number or deterministic. Deterministic means every time that I create that, it's the same. So the same, let's say John, always becomes the same string. That may be important for some tests. And we can also uh, have specific patterns here. We have social security numbers. You can create a random new social security number, or you can mask. You can create a random phone, a random uh, mask and email. And these things will even work inside the element. Even if you have a social security number inside a longer text, we will find and mask, because this is a pattern, right? But what if our uh, built-in rules are not enough? You can create your own, OK? Same thing, you will use the expat to find and you create your own policy about what to do. Just have to get the piece of uh, text that is coming from the element and transform in any way that you want. We have uh, existing, but it's very flexible. Yes? So for flexible applications, it's the same kind of reduction as well? Similar, yeah. But flexible replication will not have this concept of finding information with XPath. But you could achieve similar behavior, yes. This is uh, with MLCP. Hi, what was the question? Yeah, that will repeat the question. Uh, he's asking about flexible replication. In the previous session, we were talking about modifying documents before you use FlexRap. It will be with uh, XSLT uh, transformation to remove, for instance, information from the document. Much harder to do uh, masking or modifications that you would really need to write code but possible. Yeah. This is a much simplified, simpler way of doing. You create a, a policy. My example, I have my redaction, and I apply a collection of policies. Let's say I want to redact social security numbers. I want to create new phone numbers. You create a policy. And let's call it for developers. I may have another policy for QA or another for partners. And I apply, and MLCP will generate the data according to that policy. Everything is audited. So all the operations that you do have a track record of what you applied, what were the rules, who did that. So it's a very secure from that aspect as well. Key takeaways, uh, Rangan told us uh, about the CIA model, the AAA model, and reminded us that security is uh, only as strong as the weakest link. So you have to think holistic, not just about Mark logic. And you talk about many ways of a machine to machine authentication, all types of uh, authentication uh, features that we have. We support rollback, A back, P back, L back. We have local or uh, delegated. You can use an LDAP that enhances security. And we have robust auditing in existing features and in new features. All right, so that covers all aspects of the product. And I want to invite you guys to try encryption, redaction, and element security in early access is available as of now. And with that, I already answered uh, questions, but open to more questions to me or to Rangan. Sure. So I have, I have a question concerning uh, user passwords. Mm -hmm. In version 9, will an individual user on local authentication be able to change their own password? No. Is there a reason? Uh, for local authentication, what we do is we save it uh, in a certain format and manner. Uh, 
the way you would, if you want to change it, would be to actually create a user and then change the password. So. You would have to expose a, a, yeah. a service, a, create a the, extension the, REST server to allow users to do that, that yeah. will AMP and do that notification. Yeah. You can do it, but it's not okay. out of the yeah. box. Right. It's not. I just find it very interesting. I've dealt with a lot of technologies, and MarkLogic is the first one that I've ever come across that, you, that a individual user can't change their password unless you write a program around it. Right. Yeah, we have the hooks, but... Yeah, we have, have the hooks, something. but it's not out of the box. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think in, in, as a general principle, we recommend customers to use external authentication yeah. that That's enhances the security, security. Mm -hmm. and therefore we don't even have the password, so. We're moving that way, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just kind of curious. Number two, right? Mm -hmm. I had somebody that, uh, that I worked with wanted to know how you log off. Oh, okay, log off. there is no log off function per se. Uh, the application will have to destroy the cookie or a marker or whatever you have to do that, yeah. We are up, uh, but um, we'll all still be around. Well, one more question. Can we implement the red action using the geo-specific uh, controls if possible? E so, yeah. yeah. It would, well, yes, you will have different roles, right? I assume that someone in California will have to have a different role from someone in New York, for instance. That goes by based on the document? It would be based on the role, right? You may have multiple paths uh, for the same information tied to different roles, and the behavior will be slightly different for uh, different roles. I guess, yes, if you could later on describe to me in detail, I'll mm -hmm. tell you how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it should be possible. Yeah, you will replicate, but locally you have different roles that will grant to you access to different uh, information in the document. It, it should be the perfect solution. Just let's go into the details. Okay, uh, we are done here, but I'll be around. Uh, we can talk about it. Thank you.